grueling drive, they stopped at a nearby empty diner. Waiting for their meal, their one-year-old started waving and saying hi to someone across the restaurant. To the mother's dismay, she saw a wreck of a man. In tattered, dirty clothes, unkept and unwashed, obviously a homeless drunk. Now he was waiting back. Hi, baby. Hi, big boy. Hi, Buster. How are you? Now she and her husband exchanged glances, and the other patrons of the restaurant were raising eyebrows. No one was amused. Even her six-year-old couldn't understand why this man was talking so loudly. As he continued to eat, this went on even louder. And now the man was shouting, do you know patty cake? Do you know peekaboo? Look, he knows peekaboo. The woman and her husband were cringing with embarrassment. She tried to turn the high chair around, but the baby screamed and twisted his face to, to the see his new buddy. Not wanting to finish their, ma their meal, the husband got up to pay the bill and took his six-year-old son to the car. The woman lifted her baby to her chest and praying to herself that she could get past the old drunk without making a conversation or making a promotion. But this was clearly not meant to be. As she approached him, her young son reached out with both arms. His pick-me-up said no. And she could see the old man's eyes asking, please, could I hold the baby? There wasn't time to answer. Her little boy leaped into the man's arms. And for a few long moments, there was a communion. An old man and a young boy in a love relationship. She could see the tears beneath the man's lashes as her son laid his hand up, head on his shoulder. He gently rocked him and cradled the little boy. Then he looked straight into her eyes and she said, he said, you take care of this little baby, he said firmly. When he finished finally releasing him and the boys into her arms, it's as if he were tearing away his own heart. His final words were to her, God bless you, ma'am. You have given me my Christmas gift. And as she mumbled something in return and rushed to her car with her own tears flowing down her face, her only thought was, my God, my God, help me let go of my outward judgments. Allow me to see someone's humanness. So this is what our message is about. Something about Martin Luther King and Mahat Gandhi saying, I want to be, you be the change you want to see in the world. And this is what we want to talk about today, about how this work of Marshall Rosenberg, he developed the work of nonviolent communication after the work of Martin Luther King and Gandhi. And yet, it seems so simple when we come to church on Sunday mornings, like we learn how to be spiritual, we learn how to uh, fill our hearts with love, but there's moments in our life, much like when I read this story for the first time, I was like, I can relate to the lady being a little scared, a little worried, but also wanting to like erase the blinders of how I see people or how I bring old thoughts or old judgments forward. I had to run again. <laughs> so this is the book that uh, Nonviolent Communication, a Language of Life. And the essence of it to me is uh, well, there's a lot of deep stuff, a lot of nice stories that really like touch your heart. Um, at, the, at the things Marshall Rosenberg, uh, different conflicts he's been involved in. But uh, for me, it's about uh, just opening, learning to open your heart and stay connected to my own heart, um, to to realize the humanness in myself and in others um, as much as possible. I think one of the deepest principles in compassionate, nonviolent communication, and we call it NBC sometimes for short, is that um, all of our actions that we take as humans are from the universal human needs that we all have. 
And so um, I've taught in Bali, in Vietnam, and in Greece, and all humans, when we ask them, what are the qualities of life that really matter to you? We have some really same human needs that we really focus on. And I think the principle is about uh, focusing on what you want, what's really important to you, coming from a heartfelt place. And having grown up in Unity since a little kid, um, the alignment with, uh, we call it NVC for short, nonviolent communication, um, is really, really similar to Unity. And uh, we have the sentence here there's only one presence, and that all humans are inherit inherently good. And that's really what, uh, what NVC is for me in the general kind of connection to, for me to be able to tap into that, even, I mean, my judgments are normal and that they will be there, but they, they have a, uh, it's important for me to have an awareness that that judgment has its own place, its own value, but it's also for me to connect to uh, what's, re what's really deep inside, again, like I said earlier, of just uh, of that inherently goodness inside myself and others. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I notice I'm feeling like a mixture of kind of excitement and nervousness. Like there's these little butterflies inside. I have so much like I want to say. And some of these things I've said like a hundred times and I'm trying to like listen, allow the divine to kind of channel through me and like pick the one that just feels most important to, to me, or that I think that you could relate to. So um, I think that principle and, and what Chad just talked about and unity about, uh, that we as humans are inherently good, and there's only one God, I noticed that's in many New Thought churches. It's so, um, it's so similar to that principle and nonviolent communication about um, we all come from this heartfelt place of needs, but sometimes our strategies that we choose don't match each other, or they don't look very compassionate. And I'm thinking about that Bible uh, scripture that um, I always thought about the Ten Commandments when I was grew, grew up in Catholic and Catholicism and. We talked about the Ten Commandments. I didn't really quite understand them all, but when I went to the New Testament, it was like, okay, if you can't remember those, here's the one, right? Love your neighbor as yourself. But that encompasses all of them, but yet, how do we do that? Like, and, the, and the unity principles or the new thought principles is so we're all good. We have God fully in us. And the third piece is like, and we want to connect our thoughts, our creation, what we're creating in our minds with God. But what happens when that's not happening? Like when I'm not able to do that in my everyday life. I love the practice of my spiritual practices of meditation and grounding and listening to things. But what happens when I get into a relationship with somebody? So that's the piece where I think a great companionship between my spiritual practices and maybe nonviolent compassionate communication is how can I not only speak what's in my heart, but what do I do with what happens when I get triggered or I start to judge? Yeah, when you're saying that, I was, uh, I'm thinking of, you know, of my connection with my God or higher power and that uh, how NBC for me is a Although it's become a kind of a way of life now where it, it's kind of um, ingrained in me and I can really tell when I'm <laughs> straying far away as well. But it's like, what are the, what are the components that I can put in my life that, that almost like uh, give me more of a chance to be connected to God and, and my um, basic goodness? Um, so NBC is one of those things, just like meditation. And uh, yeah, the, I, I'm just thinking of the different ways that I can set things up in my life that have more of a chance for me to have more of what I want. So I thought you should read this other story. It's 
It's about maybe when we're when we could be curious or not. This is called the cookie thief. A woman was waiting at an airport one night with several long hours before her flight. She hunted for a book in the airport shops, bought a bag of cookies, and found a place to drop. She was engrossed in her book, but, ha but happened to see that a man, that the man sitting beside her, as bold as he could be, grabbed a cookie or two from the bag in between, which she tried to ignore to avoid a scene. So she munched the cookies and watched the clock. At the gusty, at the gutsy cookie thief diminished her stock, as. She was getting more irritated as the minutes ticked by, thinking, if I wasn't so nice, I would blacken his eye. <laughs> With each cookie she took, he took one too. When only one was left, she wondered what he would do. With a smile on his face and a nervous laugh, he took the last cookie and broke it in half. <laughs> he offered her half as he ate the other. She snatched it from him and thought, oh, brother. This guy has some nerve, and he's also rude. Why he didn't even show any gratitude? She had never known when she had been so galled. Oh, sorry, she had never known when she had been so galled. And sighed with relief when her flight was called. She gathered her belongings and headed to the gate, refusing to look back at the thieving, th thieving and great. <laughs> She boarded the plane and sank in her seat. Then she saw her book, which was almost complete. As she reached in her baggage, she grasped with surprise. There was a, her bag of cookies in front of her eyes. If <laughs> mine are here, she moaned in despair. The others were his, and he tried to share. <laughs> Too late to apologize, she realized with grief that she was the rude one, the ingrate. The thief. <laughs> I should have practiced reading that. <laughs> she, she showed me a video of this. It was like a little short movie, and I was like, that's kind of long. She's like, well, there's a poem to it. I'm like, yeah, that's good. But uh, it's just so lighthearted, but it just, yeah, oh, I, I can just so relate to with loved ones, with strangers, with, with anyone, just, you know, just making up this story and also isolating to where I don't even say what's going on because I almost feel guilty because this little tiny thing is bothering me and in the grand scheme of things, who cares if somebody were taking your cookies, you know? Um, but it's like this story comes up in me and it becomes so real, it becomes my reality. And it's painful, it's painful for me, especially when I'm when I just keep it inside, it's like, I always uh, think of it as weight, like it really weighs a lot. Um, and for me, that's really where the compassion and communication uh, comes into play for me, is that I, I'm very much a, a, in the growing, uh, even though I've been around it a lot, I'm still growing every day to just tap into it more often, not completely, not look at it as a failure that I can't embody it all the time. But I know that when I can connect to my heart and my basic goodness and what is really underneath the really, the universal needs that we're gonna talk about, um, it weighs less in me. And, it, and it, uh, it, it, you can just imagine it impacts my life in a butterfly effect way. And uh, yeah, sometimes, just that innocence of, of making up that story and then then having that humbling experience, noticing that uh, that none of it was true. And it was like this, almost like this wasted energy and it's, it's painful. And it, it's, uh, I think of it as like, when I think of affirmations, I also think of, there's the <coughs> opposite of affirmations too. If you're, if you're saying I am this and I am that of the, on the negative side too, so it almost becomes like a self-fulfilling, growing uh, type of thing. Like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah. yeah. I think about the cookie thief story and how that, how do we practice living compassion every day in our everyday life? And I think this combination of the, of the new 
new thought principles of focusing on what we want and these universal human needs is knowing every moment about what's going on with you. So if I take that story of the cookie thief, like at first, you know, first of all, there's like a, a fostering of curiosity. Like I'm sitting here and someone starts eating my food, my cookies. So what do you think her needs were? Maybe for choice, understanding, you know, like she had some really clear needs. She didn't speak to them or really tune into them. She just started off with the story. And then I imagine when she found out, you know, that, oh my gosh, my cookies are right here in the bag. It totally shifted stories for her. And maybe her needs right then were for mourning. That she was not, you know, offering gratitude, thanks for sharing the cookies. Or maybe her need right there was for understanding and clarity on both sides. So when something comes up and you get triggered, and a trigger's like, Something happens and now you're kind of heated up or you're starting, to, you're starting your stories or starting your judgments are starting. And what I love about compassionate nonviolent communication is there's a welcoming. There's actually a welcoming of our judgments and our stories that we have conscious awareness that they're there and that we know they're there. Our mind helps us make heartfelt, need-based judgments when they go in this other direction, we can also pull them back by guessing what the needs are underneath of them. So for me, when I, my judgments are at their highest, it's almost like a fire alarm to say, something is really, really, really important to me right now. So it tunes me into what I'm feeling, what I'm needing by connecting with myself. You know, I hope to start tuning into someone else, maybe what's going on for them. And then when I'm talking with someone, it's listening to them in a certain way of curiosity. And there's a certain way of listening to them around their human needs that are just like mine. So if we're in tension or we're in conflict and I start to communicate in this way, it's like I move from my side of the table over to their side of the table. Because now we're on the same side because we're on this common plane of these universal human needs that we all have. So let's let's play with it a little bit. You have in your bulletin a little uh, sheet. There's a there's a poem by Thich Nhat Hanh in there, but there's some universal human needs. So for just a few minutes, I want you to think about someone in your life that's driving you slightly crazy. <laughs> begin to see if we were to say you're so entitled versus 
I really, really have a need for cooperation that we work together in harmony where we're all on the same page. See how you're starting to focus on what you want versus what that person is or, or what that situation is. That's kind of how it works, but let's play with Chad for a minute and see if we can play for just a moment. What was your judgment? And maybe your need. Maybe share just a little bit about it. So a little bit, like small backstory. Yeah. Um, well, with uh, and I, I did literally think about this before the service. Um, so today's Father's Day, and my dad uh, passed away this past year. So naturally, I'm I'm thinking about him today. Um, but at the same time, I'm having uh, you know the sadness, but also all the uh, the memories. Um, there. So at the end of his life, he, I'll just say it short, he didn't uh, prepare in the way that I thought he would um, with what it was going to be like. And, and we did know he was going to pass away. And he actually said it's going to be simple. Everything's going to be just right. Um, but yeah, and my judgment around that, I guess, is like, uh, you know, like he, he didn't think it through. Um, yeah, kind of like, you know, what, are, what about us? We're still here. Um, maybe you could help me with the judgment words on that. So what I really love, what I'm doing now is a big component is around how to listen to somebody. Maybe, I mean, this was a softer version. Maybe it's like, he didn't care about me. And I start to tune in and become curious. I don't know, but I'm just guessing. So it's how I'm tuning into myself or to someone else, like, I'm guessing that you really want to see physical signs that you love him and you miss him so much and you want to see physical signs about how much he cared. Like that he really thought of you all throughout your life. And thought about, I'm going to leave Chad this favorite hammer or I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to prepare this way for my grandkids so that there's some memories and just some real physical, tangible things that you can see to stay really heartfelt connected. Am I, am I tuning in? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. yeah. So you can see, I'm just wondering if, like, just all of a sudden you went from judgment, just the heartfelt mourning and tenderness and love. Uh, yeah, you definitely hit it on with that. At the same time, this feeling like what's really deep inside of me, or, or you pointing that out and it kind of resonating, it's like I still have that, like, you know, I flip back and forth between having that kind of, um, like, empathy for myself, or compassion, that it is hard, that it's painful, um, but that I also, you know, it's like it, it instantly sparks the, like, should have, you should have, <laughs> all these, all these shoulds. Imagine too now. I'm just are you okay if I do a little t sharing with them as I'm with you? Um, I imagine that one of the ways when we when we have a lot of pain about something, like if you think about the family member you've never got along with or the situation, the pain sometimes we protect ourselves through our judgments and our stories. We don't want to feel so scary and sometimes you'll get in a conversation maybe Chad will be sharing and then I go into my own story or I start giving him advice or I start you know uh, just a multiple things that we can do but when when I'm able to hold an empathic presence for someone in this moment Chad it allows him to be accompanied around his tenderness and that's where the healing is this is the essence of everything we're teaching here. Where I can touch into my heart, touch into the divine, and allow the divine to hold me. Either the divine in me to hold me, or someone else. So my divine essence, and offering a particular way of tuning into chat, that's my divine connecting with his for that moment of love, tenderness, 
a deeper connection between us in the moment. It's all in there. And what's so precious, I just want to check in with you to see how you are, if there's something else you want to share on that. We might have opened the topic. This is so sweet, so sweet and sweet, vulnerably and heartfelt. Before we kind of move towards your closing. Um, I, I guess I just want to say that our, our interaction is like this a lot of times. And then sometimes I'm, I'm uh, uh, just to be authentic, that you know, I'm not ready for empathy guesses yet. Or, or maybe sometimes we might, I might need this, uh, I can already feel it, that I could like, this could go way deeper. And there's way more in there than I realize. Um, but yeah, it's happening to just like what it really, what really is going on with me is it is definitely different than uh, than just kind of spending that judgment, nasty energy around you know like on Father's Day thinking of these these mean judgments of of my dad or this it's just a nasty thing and. Um, yeah, I guess I'm just a little struck that <laughs> I'll look kind of happy for a second. Yeah. Um, so you can imagine the people all over the world, including us, are, do, are, are hearing and listening to each other in this way. Last, uh, last uh, spring, the organization that I work for, we brought Ten, five Palestinians and five Israelis here to Columbus to, for a week retreat to practice and learn nonviolent communication. So there's work like this, people like us doing work like this all over the world. And you can imagine when people, it doesn't, it takes something like this to get the story and thoughts to create wars. So while nonviolent communication, when you think, I'm not violent, not physically, but Arur Gandhi, Gandhi's um, grandson, wrote the foreword for nonviolent communication. And Gandhi said, I want you to write on your wall how many acts of physical violence that you see and how many acts of emotional violence you see. And when he came to visit the next week, like the physical violences were about this big, but the whole wall was covered with emotional ways that we talk to each other, even with the best intent at moments. So what I'm hoping today as we close that there's something that you've heard that you might be inspired to learn a little bit more. And there's classes and trainings that I offer or can come here or you can get on YouTube and see it all across the internet just in any way that you want to learn. Or maybe there's just something in the words today that you'll take away and say, Next time I'm in a conversation, I'm going to tune in with curiosity about what really matters to me or what really matters to you. And notice when I'm focusing on that versus what I don't want, that can change everything. So Chad's going to end with a song for us.